So, very good. So you're all very welcome uh, to this uh, special Irish Wildlife Trust webinar series all about the Water Framework Directive. So don't worry uh, if you've never heard of the Water Framework Directive, you don't know what it is, or maybe you have uh, some ideas about what it is, we're going to hopefully clear up a lot of that uh, today. And we have some excellent speakers uh, for you. Just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Porrick Fogarty, I'm the Campaign Officer with the Irish Wildlife Trust. Uh, and we hold webinars pretty much uh, monthly, uh, and with the odd exception for special events, such as what we're doing today. Um, so do tune into our regular webinar series, which is mostly uh, monthly. And if you go onto our website, which is iwt.ie, you will find a page uh, linking to all the webinars that we have been doing over the past couple of years uh, on all manner of topics uh, related to wildlife and the environment uh, that, uh, that may be of interest to you. Also to know, please, that the Irish Wildlife Trust is a charitable, non-governmental organisation. If you want to support our work uh, and what we do, and uh, which includes holding webinars like these and having them free and available to people, please do consider joining uh, and becoming a member of the Irish Wildlife Trust. Uh, it's a relatively small annual fee and you'll get a copy of our magazine and, uh, and enjoy the other benefits of being a member. So go on to iwt.ie for that. Now, uh, this webinar is recorded, as uh, I've probably already said, and it will be on uh, our website later. So uh, if you do know other people who are interested in it, uh, that link will be, will be available. So today we're going to talk about uh, water and we're kicking off this series uh, on the Water Framework Directive. It's going to be we're going to hold a webinar uh, similar to this one every Wednesday for the rest of this month. And that's because uh, this month is marking the culmination of a process of public consultation on the draft river basin management plan uh, that is being produced by the government as part of its requirements under the Water Framework Directive. And so that public consultation is open and organizations like our own uh, will be uh, making submissions to that. And of course, it's open to anybody to make a submission uh, and to highlight the importance of water um, to your area and uh, to yourself indeed, um, and, and to make your voice heard uh, with the government. Now, we live in a time of crisis, and uh, it can seem like there are crises coming at us from every direction. Uh, not only with security and energy and climate and biodiversity, and uh, but also water. And these, of course, are very much linked to the other crises that we have at the moment. Uh, and it's very important that we see uh, the protection of our water uh, as part of, uh, not only part of the problem, but as part of the solution to our other crises that we face. And central to our uh, response to this water crisis is the Water Framework Directive. Uh, it is the central piece of legislation uh, for over a decade, nearly two decades, I think, uh, since it was first uh, brought in by the European Union uh, in uh, achieving good status for our water bodies. And I won't go into that too much because our guests will, will give us more detail on that. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our speakers just to say the format for this hour will be uh, our speakers will each have about 20 minutes to talk and give their presentation. Uh, Sinead from SWAN uh, will be talking about more or less the, the national picture and the policy response. Uh, Trish is coming to us today from Moville on the Inish Owen Peninsula in Donegal. And uh, Trish will give us a more localized view of why this matters. And of course, it's important for us to join the dots between uh, international problems, national problems, and bring it down to the local uh, and, and to how this affects uh, all of us in our own particular area, water after all is absolutely vital to everything we do as well as uh, the wildlife around us. So our first speaker today, uh, I'll, I'll go to Sinead, uh, if that's okay with you Sinead. And uh, Sinead is the coordinator of the Sustainable Water Network or SWAN for short. And SWAN is an umbrella group of environmental organizations of which the Irish Wildlife Trust is one member. And we're delighted to be holding these webinars uh, in, associate, in association with SWAN. Uh, so over to you Sinead, please, in your own time, if you, want, if you have slides, uh, share your screen. 
Thanks, Parikh. Yep. I'll just do that now. Just need to get back to the start. Can you see those? Yes, that's perfect. Great. Yeah. That's Great. Good. Okay. Hi, everybody, um, and thanks, Pari, to the for the uh, invitation to the to the webinar. So this has been a fun exercise for me. Actually, it's been an exercise of revision because, despite the fact that Swan has been working on the Water Framework Directive for 15 years, and it is more or less the Bible uh, for all of our work. It was a while since I'd taken out the text of the directive and had a good look at it again. So um, having said that, it's a very complex directive. And I know that the colleges do like courses and lectures and seminars on the Water Framework Directive. So just excuse in advance, this is just going to be a, a whistle stop tour and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. So I'm just going to, um, tell you what the obligations of the directive is, what do we need to achieve, what's what's mandatory under the directive, what does it say about what we need to do to get there, um, then what are its key components, and then where does the River Basin Management Plan um, and the consultation that's um, happening at the moment, where does that fit in? What has the Water Framework Directive meant for water management in Ireland? And then how has it been implemented? And I'm going to provide some comments from Swan's perspective as to how we we feel that has gone, some assessment, and then some recommendations at the end for a river basin management plan that we would see us see us Ireland getting up to, back up to number one, which is the objectives that we need to achieve. So what's the water framework directive? There it is there, the, the document itself. It's with the full title, um, EC directive, uh, 2060 EC, establishing a framework for community action in the field of water policy, the Water Framework Directive. It came into force in 2000, hard to believe it's uh, 22 years ago, and it provides a framework for protection of all waters, rivers, lakes, and also artificial water bodies like canals, reservoirs, and estuaries, coastal waters, and groundwaters, and not forgetting our wetlands and other water-dependent ecosystems and associated habitats. And it's one of the most comprehensive and progressive pieces of legislation. I might be a bit biased, but I think to ever come out of the EU, and I actually am not sure that it would even get through now. It was it was a kind of in the halcyon days of the EU when the, there was a, a, um, a domination of progressives and greens in the parliament. Um, and it's been heavily criticized since for its unrealistic level of ambition, which of course is, you know, we have, we have held and our colleagues in Europe have held many member states to account over. So the first cycle ran from 2009 to 15, and then it runs in six year cycles, and we're now entering into the third cycle, 2022 to 2027. So then what do we have to do under the directive? So this is slightly paraphrased, but more or less straight from the, from the law itself. We have to protect and where necessary, improve the quality of our inland and coastal waters and our groundwaters and wetlands, and this is an important one, and we're breaking this rule all, all over the place in Ireland, prevent their further deterioration from the baseline of, and there's been some legal debate about this, but um, I think it's more or less agreed 2009 is the baseline year. It was the first year all the waters were characterized in Europe. Then we have to achieve good status, and I'm going to tell you what that means exactly for all those waters by, oh, look at the naivety of it, 2015, my God. We were actually working towards that. Then 2021, and now the ultimate uh, deadline is 2027. Now, there are certain exemptions to that under criteria that are set out in Article 4, but you, they, they're they quite strict and, um, and you have to put forward a case, the member state has to put forward a case in the River Basin Management Plan to be allowed to do that. It's a bit like the overriding public interest clause in the Habitats Directive. Then we you, member states have to promote the sustainable use of water reduce pollution of, by chemi hazardous chemicals and lessen the effects of flooding and drought. So I'm going to focus mainly on the first two. So what exactly is good status? So in the directive, status is divided up into high good, moderate, poor and bad. And the pass and fail is between good and moderate there. And the, arrow, the arrows with the red line through them shows that there's no deterioration is allowed. So to tell you what good status is, which is like 
passing the Water Framework Directive, I have to first tell you what high status is because everything is defined in relation to that. So high status is happy fishies. There has to be no or only very minor anthropogenic alterations to the biological, physical and hydromorphological quality elements in a water body uh, from what could what is deemed to be undisturbed conditions. And then good status is um, only low levels of distortion and devi very slight deviation from normal conditions. So that's basically you're only allowed to have a slight deviation. Anything below that over there on the right in red goes from you know moderate deviation to extreme, and that's none of that is allowed. That's a fail. And this is where it gets quite technical, and we don't have time. But I'm just going to take rivers as an example. And how do you decide, you know, how does the EPA decide what good status is in a river is? And the directive is very prescriptive on this. It has quite a detailed annex, Annex 5, that tells, tells scientists exactly how to do that, more or less. So it's divided into biological, physical, chemical, and hydromorphological. And all of those different elements have to be, mon have to be uh, monitored and tested for. So under biology, then, that would be phytoplankton, so microscopic plants, macrophytes, they're the bigger plants, phytobenthos, the plants that grow at the bottom of the river, and then benthic invertebrates, the bugs in the river, and fish. Physical chemical is things like pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and then hydromorphology, a bit of a mouthful, that means the hydrological re regime, the flow in the river, then the continuity, how, you know, whether there's barriers in the river, is the river connected to its floodplain, and then morphological conditions is the is the river natural or is it is it channelized and um, and does it flow in a natural way and then when all of that has been done by the epa as it has been done it's all been pulled together into the river based management plan and that red line there shows um basically the pass and the fail and in ireland having done all of that analysis we know that 47 only 47 percent of our water bodies are crossing that good status line. So what else then does the Water Framework Directive require for us in order to get to good objectives? And there's three that I've pulled out, the three key ones are that it's based around the concept of ecological quality. So it's not just old school going in, you know, testing pH and, you know, chemicals in the water. It's all to do with the ecological health under all those quality elements that I, that I just described. Then it requires an integrated catchment management approach to water rather than, you know, the old administrative boundaries. And this is critical for all of us. It, it, it requires the involvement of the public. And there's a special Article 14 and requires that the active involvement of all interesting, interested parties must be encouraged. And you, I've just shown a map there from the plan that shows the different 46 catchments in the country that are going to be, need to be managed at that scale. So you can see that that's very different from looking at, you know, a map of the counties. And that's one of the big things the Water Framework Directive has done. And then where does the River Basin Management Plan fit in? So that's the key tool for, um, for managing, for setting in place that cycle of uh, stepwise. I first of all call it stepwise, but actually it's more cynical, cyclical rather. You have to delineate and characterize all of those catchments that I showed and all the water bodies in them, and then define the status of them, what's causing that status, the pressure and impacts, then develop a program of measures to address them and bring us up to good status by 2027. And then the River Basin Management Plan has to present a summary of those measures, not the full detail, but a summary. And I've just copied below the article um, from the directive, a summary of the program of measures including way, the ways that the objectives of the directive will need to be achieved must be in the plan. And then, as you can see in that cyclical graph on the, on the right, progress has to be monitored. And then if the measures aren't working, new measures have to be, have to be uh, implemented. So what is it meant for water management in Ireland then? Just checking the time. Uh, well, it's, it's, made, it's, it's resulted in massive changes. Really, there's a whole new water administration system. There's a new EPA catchments unit, um, and there's a new website, catchments.ie. There's the establishment of a new local authorities water program with 14 
community water officers. There's a new agricultural sustainability advisory program. There's the, 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 the National Water Forum was established. And then there's been the establishment of catchment groups and rivers trusts that I think um, Trish will speak more about, but definitely has been encouraged, if not fully driven by the water frame objective. And then uh, uh, the, the establishment of SWAN was also driven by the, the introduction of the water framework directive. So it definitely has changed the water landscape in Ireland for the better. But has it resulted in protection, increased protection of water, which is the, the fundamental question that Swan wants to ask. And so to, to make, um, to give some commentary about the implementation of the water framework directive in Ireland, I'm going to talk a little bit about the draft plan because um, in the interest of time, I, I don't, I can't comment on everything that's been done in the implementation of the directive. And so I just want to take us all to exactly where we are in the process now. So we've had 20 years of the plan. We're now at the point where the final plan and the, in the three six year cycles is being decided. And I guess as, as, as experts, we are having a look at it and, and using that as a kind of, as the yardstick for how good implementation is. So there is, in the plan on the on the plus side there is definitely some very ambitious language around improving water quality what would you know one would expect that after 22 years and declining water quality you'd hope it would be somewhat ambitious there is um, a commitment to 46 catchment plans for those catchments that i showed you and there is some laudable aspirations in the plan around reducing nitrate nitrate and rewetting organic soil and there is very concrete proposal for new legislation on physical works to water bodies. And I'm, you know, it's not the role of today for me to give a full analysis of the plan. And we did a webinar on that recently, but I'm just going to give you a quick whistle stop to give you an idea of where we're, at, where we're at and where the Water Framework Directive has brought us to on some of the key issues. The first one is how close are we to getting where we need to go? As I said earlier, um, 47% of our water bodies are failing. And 33% of our um, inland water bodies are either failing or at risk. And there's only a plan to, to fix some of those. So that's, we deem that to not be satisfactory. And there's only certain targeted areas. So the Water Framework Directive says that you should do this for all water bodies. Whereas because the Water Framework Directive is so ambitious, I think the government has decided, no, no, we just focus on some priority areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're recommending later. In terms of water governance, there's a whole new administrative system that wouldn't be there, and, and that's pointed to and, and praised a lot. But we still don't have one body ultimately responsible, which is what the Water Framework Directive envisaged, even if it didn't legally require it. And there's still a complete lack of policy coherence. And policy coherence is, you know, according to the OECD, is one of the, the elements for successful water governance. Then in relation to public participation, um, there's still a lack of transparency about um, the structures that are in place and who's deciding what and, you know, kind of boring things like minutes of meetings and things. But, you, you know, we really do need to need to see those so that we can understand exactly how the directive is being implemented. And then there is some support for Rivers Trust. And I'm sure Trish will talk about this as well. But, you know, it's very modest. And there's still no real program for integrating stakeholders to get involved in, in water management at local level or at, at regional and catchment level. And we, um, the National Water Forum that's been established at national level is, is very, very welcome, but we're not really seeing the recommendations feeding through to national policy. And then I have two last ones. I just want to touch on agriculture because how could you not with the, the day that's in it and all the controversy that's going on at the moment it is the predominant pressure. The water bodies impacted by agriculture have gone up by a quarter since the last cycle. The national herd has gone up. Nitrogen emissions have gone up. The increase in herd is linked to the increase in water pollution. But yet the river based management plan mostly relies on cap and nitrates, the nitrous action program. There's a continuation of the ag food strategy and this trajectory of increased intensification. And there's no assessment for water impacts before the derogation is granted. And there's, there's no management really of intensification and vulnerable catchments. And then for urban wastewater, there's 210 water bodies where it's an issue and it's causing pollution and the plan doesn't propose measures to fix all of those. So that gets us to what we are recommending to fix it. And 
for the river basin management plan to do what, bringing us back to the very first slide, to do what the water framework directive legally obliges us to do, which is to bring all our water bodies up to good status, at least by 2027, using the measures in this plan and to prevent any further deterioration. And so we're saying that the plan needs to be a lot more ambitious and have measures for all those water bodies. We need to have a new permitting system that would assess farms before they intensify further, especially in um, vulnerable catchments, through some kind of a permitting system um, and using the vulnerability maps that the EPA have developed. Uh, we want a complete prohibition on wetland drainage and a national wetland restoration plan to be implemented as a matter of urgency. And that would have massive benefits for climate change mitigation and adaptation and biodiversity as well. And it seems like a basic one, but the plan has to have measures to stop pollution from those 200 odd water bodies that are being impacted almost solely by wastewater sewage discharge. We want something similar to far, for forestry as for agriculture. So there needs to be a, a sort of an assessment before far planting, um, planting and felling licenses are given out that make sure that that work is not going to impact on water or puts uh, mitigation measures in place. And then uh, I didn't stress this probably or, uh, enough earlier, but the water framework directive expands to extends to one nautical mile. And so it should include measures to look after our coastal zone as well. And at the moment, the plan doesn't have anything in that. So one of the things that the water framework directive envisaged was that it would provide an integrated approach to managing our waters, as did the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which also envisaged an integrated approach with the Water Framework Directive to look at our coastal zone and manage it in an integrated way. And that is not happening. So that's one way in which the implementation of the directive has really has completely failed, so much so that there isn't even a chapter on coastal waters in this plan. And then in relation to governance, it, do, it needs to be more um, transparent. We, it needs to be in compliance with the Aarhus Convention, you know, as a bare minimum. And there needs to be support for those local groups like Trisha's Rivers, River Trust to assist them in their work on the ground, but also so that they can get fully involved in decision making around their local uh, water bodies. So I'll leave it there for now and look forward to questions later. Thanks, Parik. Uh, thanks so much, Sinead. I, th I think you did a wonderful job of uh, uh, of taking something that is quite uh, prosaic and complex and 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 translating it into something that uh, that we can understand because it is a piece, a big piece of legislation. But it's also we don't want to uh, give the impression that this is somehow a technical or illegal, uh, uh, you know, requirement. This is about. The waterways uh, that we know and we love, and it's about the water that comes out of our tap and the places we go swimming and uh, and 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 the wildlife habitat for for much of the wildlife in Ireland. So it's very it's very personal to uh, to us all, I think. And Sinead, you might maybe just before we move on to Trish, you know, if if I'm looking at my local river, or my local lake, or my estuary, how can I find out what kind of status it's in or what kind of pressures it's under? Well, this. Kind of, there's two answers to that. Um, I guess the official answer is you would go to catchments.ie and you would have a look. I find that I'm not great with interactive maps and things, so I struggle a little bit with that. Other people find it fine. But I would actually, the, an easier way to do it is get in contact with your community water officer and ask them. So it depends how much time you have, I guess. And, and Trish probably might be able to comment on it as well. But I'd get on to... Uh, lawaters.ie look up who your community water officer is and ask them because you can then you know because if you find out it's not in good condition you know if you're interested enough to do that you probably want to find out why mm. and catchments.ie is not great for that you know you want to actually have somebody on the phone and ask them like what are the problems and what's being done about it um, is there an issue then with the availability of information and accessibility there is at local level yeah and at catchment level because the the EPA catchment unit do excellent work, but their monitoring and assessment is done on a, I think it's a, could be corrected here, it's either a three year or four year cycle, Trish, Trish will probably know. And so they're three year cycle. So they do, they do all very comprehensive and then they upload reports, but it's not very real time. And also they can't do the ground truth thing like the local authority catchment scientists and groups like Trish can do. So they often don't know the nitty gritty of what's causing the problem. 
Um, so yeah, there is definitely an issue. And we were told a couple of years ago that they were going to do catchment management plans and that they would be done in draft and then people could look at them and see what the issues were. But actually they've taken a negotiating behind the scenes approach, which they feel is more, um, I can't think of the word, more practical and more pragmatic. So they don't really want local plans that are going to kind of say, there's an issue with forestry here because then people will be annoyed. They prefer to just go to the forest service and have a quiet word, you know, sort of work within the system. So we've been highly critical of that. And we're very, we're very much welcoming the river basin management plan saying that there are going to definitely be 46 catchment plans this time. So hopefully that transparency issue will be addressed. Yeah, that's very important. Obviously, if public participation is, is supposed to be central to us, uh, people need to have the information to act on. Okay. But uh, thank you so much for that, Sinead. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Trish in Donegal. And as you would have seen from Sinead's presentation, the country is divided up into catchment areas. And of course, every catchment has its own issues and its own individuality. And uh, Trish is working for the Inish Owen Rivers Trust and uh, will give us an idea about how uh, these uh, principles in the Water Framework Directive are applied at a local level. So over to you, Trish, in your own time. Great. Thanks very much, Porrick. And thank you, Sinead, for that very kind of high level um, uh, synopsis of the Water Framework Directive and the River Basins Management Plan. I'm going to bring it right back down and I'm going to give you some just feedback, really, from the community, from what we hear on the ground when we're working with people. So, um, so just to give you a bit of background from myself um, and why I've been asked to do this, um, I've been working uh, at a grassroots level with uh, people in the community in water related projects for the last um, few good few years now. Um, we, um, I started off with Celebrate Water. Um, about 11 years ago um, as a as a community based water group that was just exploring ideas around water and encouraging people to get more involved with water and our strap line at that time was connecting people place and nature, which is still so relevant for us because it is all about that It's getting people to turn back towards the rivers and the seas and understand nature better. So the um, Celebrate Water led to the formation of the Inishon Rivers Trust. And the Inishon Rivers Trust has been working for the last five and a half years in Inishon um, to build awareness, um, to engage communities in projects and, and um, learning more about water um, and running a few projects, for instance, on flooding. And we're running a buffer zone project at the moment as well, um, invasive species, tree planting, things like that. So I'm also involved with the Donegal um, Public Participation Network in the Environmental Linkage Group. So I'm the convener of that. And so I get the chance to talk to a lot of people um, there as well across Donegal about the kind of issues that they have. Um, I'm involved with Inishon Whales and Dolphins and Coast Watch, so that's my coastal input there. And also, and more recently, I've been involved with the setting up of the iCatch Network, which is a network for um, catchment organisations and rivers trusts around Ireland. So at the moment, we've got 15 members, and this is really a forum from which we can come together to discuss the issues that are most relevant to us. Um, so that's been very successful to date for us. So um, in terms of when you're talking to people um, on the ground and what people's understanding is of policy and legislation, um, I would say that the Water Framework Directive is, is recognised by the community as a significant piece of legislation, but how much they understand about that and how much they see the connections with all the other EU um, pieces of legislation is not clear. I mean, and it's gone to vary dramatically. A lot of the people, um, you know, when you're talking to people who are into this kind of thing, they're into the environment, they're into their rivers and coasts and, and biodiversity, they do know about this, but then a lot of people on the ground, they don't have the time, or they just, it's not really something that they're interested in. So even though it is um, an, a title, let's say the Water Framework Directive, it's out there, um, how much people understand about that is um, probably a bit more limited. So the river basin management plan seems to be a bit more, a um, uh, bit more recognised within the public. Um, so, and that has definitely increased in traction since 
um, 2015 in particular, and as a result of the work of Law Pro. So during the second cycle, when Law Pro was set up and the community water officers came onto the ground, that has been a really big um, plus for people to understand what's happening on their rivers. So on the ground, we see a lot more conversations now about water management, and it's been, um, you know, it's been very interesting listening to those. Sometimes they go off, uh, people go off on tangents. It's kind of be, you know, try to keep people focused on water management. But it is being very, very interesting to see where people's um, interests lie on that. But one thing that I would say, and this has come through particularly through PPN and talking to landowners on the ground, that there is an increased awareness of the deterioration. People are seeing it. People are saying it. And although Sinead said earlier there about 2009 being sort of the baseline for when we're starting to characterize our rivers, people talk beyond that. They talk to the times of their grandfathers and their fathers and what the rivers were like then. And there's a huge difference. And people recognize that. And the older people in particular will talk about that a lot. But also, you, we do get it from younger people that the last 10 years has seen a significant decline. So people are very cognizant of the fact that things are getting worse. So what relevance has the legislation for us on the ground? Um, well, I suppose it provides that information and that snapshot of the stasis. So whenever the indicators come out every year and people get to see what the deterioration is, what's improved, what's, what's deteriorated, that's very interesting for people and that gets media attention and that's important. And catchment certainly is a really excellent resource. Um, the public participation is getting a lot easier now, and that is as a result of the River Basin Management Plan, really, and the work of LawPro. So it's much easier for people to actually um, ring somebody up and talk to them. And just Sinead's point there about the community water officers, they do a fantastic job, um, but they are very much under-resourced. Um, we've got one uh, community water officer for Johnny Gall, Jimmy McVeigh, and he's um, really brilliant at his job and very easy to chat to, but it must be incredible the amount of calls that he gets about issues. At the same time, it's very nice to have that because sometimes it's not so easy to get in contact with um, the local authorities. It's harder to speak to them or maybe the IFI if you, if you have an issue. It can be harder to get through to those people, whereas Jimmy seems to be very accessible. So, um, one of the other things about the legislation that people have um, really grasped has been the concept of the priority area for action. So this has been has kind of captured the imagination of people. So people are kind of interested to see are there is there a catchment one of the ones that's a PAA. Now in the second cycle it was 190. Yeah, and we did get complaints. We got complaints locally from people saying, well, why isn't my catchment in there? Why were we not picked? And so the reasons why your, your um, catchment was picked, even though there are kind of basic reasons out there and you can find them, um, it's not very clear to people on the ground why. And for instance, if you're in an area where there's a significant issue with, say, your wastewater treatment plant, but you're not in a PAA, they ask the question, why is my area not a priority when we have this very big issue? So, and I've heard that from several people. So um, the fact that it, that's now increased to 310 is, is good, but probably still not enough. I mean, we need to, to deal with as many of the rivers as we can. And so people are very, very aware of that, that there needs to be more protection, more things need to be done. So one catchment is getting um, scientific officers on it to, to, to gather data and the catchment next to it isn't. And that's there, those questions come up. The other thing about the River Basin Management Plan is that it provides this list of measures. And so those, whatever, I think it's about 111 um, on the list that, that um, are things that are going to be actioned through the third cycle. Um, it's a good list and it's well written, but there's a lack of information and some lack of detail. And there is a, it, it raises lots of questions that people want answered. Um, so I suppose in terms of legislation, People are aware, a fair amount of people are aware, some people don't really bother about it, but the one thing that most people want is they want action. They want action on the ground, they want to be able to get involved, they want to be able to do things. 
participating in policy development isn't for everyone. And a lot of people just want to get out there and do something simple to help out and to be guided within that. In terms of the issues that we see um, and um, thinking about the Water Framework Directive and the River Basin Management Plan, there is this confusion over the roles and responsibilities, and this is persists all the time. Now, there are a lot of agencies and organisations involved, and we tried to demystify that a few years ago through the Rivers Trust when, when we, um, uh, we ran our Who's Who event. So the who's who was looking at all the different agencies, what were their roles and what were their responsibilities, bringing them all together into the same room to present and chat and network with local people. And it worked out really well, and it certainly really clarified things for us. But there is still some confusion on the ground. Um, people get confused between uh, the different acronyms and the, the different jargons there. Um, and I'm glad that Sinead actually brought up this thing about ecological status, because um, for, for some people, you know, they can understand the term a healthy river, but ecologic, good ecological status doesn't necessarily mean anything to people on the ground because they don't quite understand what that means, the actual reality of what that means. So for some people, a, a good river might be a river that's straight, one that has no trees in it one that's um, that runs away quickly and doesn't flood, that's not good ecological status. And so the understanding of, of what we're trying to achieve, you know, can, can be missed by some people. So in terms of the priority areas for action, there's not enough of them, as I've already said, but also um, that the information that's available to the community that's coming back from the studies and those is not there really for them. Now you can go and talk to the water officer and ask about that, but then they don't seem to have a lot of that information either. So what this, this data has been gathered, but how it translates into action on the ground is, is a gap and, and people ask questions around that. So um, also, I suppose from terms of coastal issues and because I have an interest in coastal issues myself, the lack of integration with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the MPAs and all that's happening there is there is a distinct lack of information on that and how it fits in with the River Basin Management Plan. Um, I saw recently that Ken Whelan was starting um, a, a project um, um, examining, looking at estuaries and that connection between uh, rivers and the sea. And like, you know, he's getting people on the ground to look at this and to examine this kind of thing, but it's not even in the River Basin Management Plan, that connection. Um, the lack of direction forestry measures is something that we come across a lot as we talk to farmers. So farmers have a bit of ground that um, they, you know, is not good for much, as they say themselves. Um, and so they always, the default is to think about planting trees in it, even though it's not necessarily a good place to plant trees. And so there's a bit of um, lack of direction for people on what, you know, what they can do within the forestry. And also there's this issue coming up of the legacy of these, uh, you know, coniferous plantations that we have. So we're coming up to a period in a few years time where there'll be a significant amount of felling going on and that we talk to people who can't get felling licenses. Um, we talk to people about um, they want to put in a, a bit of forestry, but they can't get the permissions to do it. It's too slow. So there there's lots of questions asked around that and what's being done um, at a policy level on that. The integrated approach, and I know this is something that the Water Framework Directive um, specifically targeted and specifically wanted to do is this integrated approach. Um, it, it, that's not obvious through um, the River Basin Management Plan that, that's coming through, that you have um, all these different agencies and this overlap between them and the different policies, they don't all align. And so that is a problem that's obvious. And that is an obvious, in, obvious in particular when you're dealing with the agricultural sector. So another thing that does come up uh, that, that people mention is cross-sectoral compliance. So um, we have, you come to a river and we know that we can't do this or we can't do that, but then an agency can come along and do it and it seems to be okay. So why is there rules for one group and not for another? And that gets asked on the ground a lot. So um, there might be some work done to um, prevent a bit of erosion on a river um, and 
there might be some you know, kind of works done that are not great. And then when a when a, a landowner tries to do it themselves, they're not allowed to do it. So there's there's a problem with that um, with that there. So um, in terms of delivering for the river basin management plan coming up and what people um, are talking about in terms of um, their submissions. So community support, the finances to support catchment groups, um, community groups, rivers trusts, that needs to increase dramatically. The Community Water Development Fund is great to have it, but it's a very, very small pot and a very large number of people who are going for that. And in addition, it doesn't cover some of the core costs. And so core funding is absolutely needed. There's a lot more that we could do on the ground if we had more funding. I'm the only employee of the Rivers Trust and there's only one other um, employee in a Rivers Trust um, in the Meg Rivers Trust. And so between the two of us, we're snowed under with the amount of calls and the amount of um, people looking for information and help and advice and support. And we're trying to also support community actions because that's what people want to do. So instead of sitting down to go through the policy and uh, talk about what they want to see, they want to actually do it. And so they need support for those kind of citizen science initiatives and getting out there with projects on the ground that are going to do good and improve the rivers. Um, the catchment plans that are being proposed, certainly more grassroots involvement in developing these. There is a very strong ecological knowledge out there and um, people have this um you know generations of knowledge about their rivers about um how they used to work what they used to look like because a lot of the times we don't know what they used to look like so um there's a lot of of knowledge um inherent in the community that that can be harnessed there and that would be done by bringing people together to do that so this educational thing also needs to be improved. So general community and public um, awareness um, needs to continue very much so. And particularly, it would be great in the farming community. I know there's been some moves on that, but that's something that needs to increase too. And that we have this alignment with agricultural policies and what's happening with the River Basin Management Plan. And also within schools, um, there could certainly be more, um, more discussion around um, the River Basin Management Plan, the Water Framework Directive at primary and secondary level. So, you know, the policy, you don't have to talk about policies at primary level, but you can certainly start to introduce bits of jargon. You know, the words catchment and um, hydrology and hydromorphology, these are all things that we talk about all the time, but that those kind of terms need to come into more general conversation that people understand these concepts. So um, overall, I think the there's a holistic approach needs to needs to happen. There's so many different aspects of it: the bi biodiversity, the climate change, um, all the, the 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 water quality stuff. It all needs to come together and not be done in silos. And there needs to be com increased compliance around that. So, in summary, uh, I would say that you know we'll continue to encourage the public to get involved. Loper have been doing a really really good job on that, but. Um, a lot of people on the ground that you mightn't hear from, they need to be brought into the conversation a bit more. And we need more education around that. And we need more support to bring those people into the conversation. So supporting the communities and valuing that local knowledge and providing feedback to them. So the information that's been gathered by the agencies, it needs to come back. Catchments is brilliant. EPA maps, Chagas maps, it's, it's all great, but that it's not accessible to everybody. Um, and so um, we and we need to get more of that information out there. So that holistic integrated approach across all the policies is something that's really badly needed, something that a lot of people in the communities recognize is needed, um, but that it's not coming across through um, the plan that's out there. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for that, uh, Trish. Uh, now we have uh, 45 minutes, or sorry, 15 minutes left. Um, so uh, if anybody has questions for either of uh, our guests, please put them into the Q&A button. Um, 
Trish, that was really good. And um, a couple of things uh, stood out for me. Number one, you said that at your at your meetings, people tend to go off on a tangent. Uh, but we're a, we're a wet place surrounded by water. So water kind of is everything. So you can kind of uh, you can see that, you know, every you know, you, you can't really just look at water in isolation because it is related to practically everything that goes on uh, in our in our country, whether that's infrastructure or our social lives or our economic lives and so on. But you also mentioned that you know, when you're talking to people, as you do, um, that one person's idea of a healthy river might be different to some other person's idea of a river, because as we know, I mean, farmers have been told for a very long time they should be cleaning out their rivers and, you know, we, you know, drainage is a good thing and, you know, flooding and all the rest of it and trees are kind of seen as a as a threat, you know, in the case they fall in and cause everything to flood. I mean, how do those conversations go? Uh, I imagine it's a hard thing to, to have to go out and say, sorry, but a lot of those ideas were wrong uh, and we have to change uh, how we look at these systems. Yeah, um, it is. It's always a difficult conversation. And um, we're at the moment in an EIP, which is creating buffer zones along a river and in the show with the Kuldaf River. And it is a difficult conversation. It's hard to persuade the landowners that we should be putting in a bit more vegetation along the river, but we need to step it back a bit. So, you know, some of them are saying, OK, you can put in a couple of trees <laughs> um, and we'll fence them off. But you want to move the fence back. We want to move the trees back because, you know, the trees over time, they need to be managed on the rivers. And this is one of the issues. They do like to see the rivers cleaned out of trees. They don't like to see big lumps of a trunk in a river, even though we know that that's a good thing. So we do say to them that the science is changing. That's the way we would normally approach it. We would say, look, the science is changing. We didn't necessarily know this years ago. And then because we have a basis in biodiversity and talking about the fish, a lot of people are interested in the fish. So you can talk about the benefits of woody material in rivers. And so some people get it. But I suppose one of the issues is that when there's a flood and their river gets flooded and they think it's because of the tree trunks in the river or that the bridge gets blocked because of all the wood, then, you know, there's issues around that. But management is really, really important. And I think that's one of the things that we've lost. People do something and leave it, leave, go away and forget about it for 20 years. You need to manage it. And I think you know, landowners should be um, compensated for managing the rivers. They're on the ground there. They can keep an eye on things and they can manage them, but they need to understand how best to do that. And so that's where, that's what we're trying to get across in our EIP at the moment. Yeah, very good. I mean, we do, we do know from, from experience at this stage that um, those kind of conversations that you're having are absolutely uh, essential. Uh, you know, people don't learn from uh, fires and things being put on the internet. We, we really, we do rely a lot on 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 face to face conversations between people, and and they're absolutely uh, invaluable. So we're very lucky to have you uh, doing the work that you're doing. Sinead, there was a question there. I'll put it to you about uh, other countries and how they go about doing it. Obviously, the Water Framework Directive applies to all EU states. I mean, how is Ireland uh, doing compared to other countries uh, and are there other countries that we can learn from uh, that are maybe doing certain things better than we are? Hmm. There's no country, I think, that I'd point to that's, saying, that's doing a brilliant job. Um, but there's good examples of various measures here and there. And I think there's some quite good examples of river restoration in Germany. There is a stretch of the River Elbe in, um, in Eastern Germany, where they've restored it, taken out barriers, introduced re-meandering into it, reconnected it with the floodplain, just on a stretch of the river. And that was driven by the Water Framework Directive. Um, another, I'm just trying to think what else, Scotland, has been good in terms of implementation, but I'd have to have a look and see how it's how it's translated into water quality. There, they have a huge water framework directive team in SEPA, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, and they've pulled together all of the agencies into a very integrated approach. But I'm not sure how well it's delivered. And then there's small areas in France where they've worked well with farmers, a bit like the way we're describing with Trish. Trish is describing where they've managed to bring down 
nutrients but it's kind of piecemeal there isn't any one country that's that you know that's done a particularly good job and it often depends on where is there a really powerful vested interest so in the countries where the farming lobby is very strong it's difficult to get results on farming i think where the navigation lobby is strong in central europe it's difficult to get results in terms of restoring rivers so but it's actually a piece of work that i'd love swan to do is to do some case studies from around europe where it's been done well so I haven't given a very good answer, but I've made a note of research opportunity. Thank you for the question. <laughs> very good. Um, Trish, you're doing um, a uh, one of your EIP projects is about buffer zones. And uh, I was just thinking maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. And in particular, I'm thinking the new common agricultural policy will uh, allow farmers to claim for up to 30% of a field or of their land that's not directly in food production. And you, because you mentioned there about, you know, if you ask a farmer to set the fence back uh, from the river by a certain number of meters, that's he's obviously losing uh, grazing land there. I mean, first of all, maybe tell us about your work on the buffer zones and then also will that cap measure be any good uh, in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Right, well, um, the Kaldaf riparian buffer um, zone scheme, crib scheme, we call it, um, it's a payment scheme. So basically we approach the farmers and we offer them a payment to get involved in the project, just to actually be involved. And the payments are aligned with how far back uh, from the river they'll allow us to set some fencing. So we we, we go to them and say, uh, do you need fencing? And we, we won't fence an area that doesn't have livestock in it. But if people have livestock, and there's no fencing there, we'll encourage them to get fencing. Um, and then we also have trees for them to plant. Um, we're also offering them beehives because um, this EIP is the fifth call, which was about farmland biodiversity. So what we did is we centered it around water. Um, and so it's about um, the fact that good, clean water is really important for biodiversity and encouraging more biodiversity. So um, we're providing beehives and so they can be honey hives or they can be freedom hives where it's just for the sake of the bees we're offering wildflowers and we're also um look helping to having this discussion around farm drains so we're talking about the drainage and we're talking about how to filter the water before it gets into the river um but we see we're seeing a lot of issues on the ground there's a lot of drainage and really um, you, you know, a lot of people just drain out the field and they cut straight drains normally along the edge of the field as well. So um, they are, you know, carrying the nutrients down. And so we try to have that conversation about trying to filter that out, first of all. Um, and so we would use nature based solutions to do that. And we have some techniques that we would show them on that. Um, and also we're talking about silt traps and ponds. Um, um, but I mean, there are issues. We see issues around roadways, farm roadways, and uh, and national roadways that there are campered in the wrong way, and that people, um, you know, that there are crossings on the rivers as well. So that's an issue, and how to deal with that. There are difficult issues to deal with. Um, in terms of the cap, what's coming forward? Um, there was some reluctance, I think, at the start. Uh, we found that people are waiting to see what happens <laughs> with the cap and they didn't want to, to move on anything until they knew. So they're trying to maximize their financial gains, basically. Um, so like you're, you know, some farmers, um, the first question is around how much is in it for me. And with other farmers, it's kind of, I, I'm not really that keen to push my, my fence back. I just want to have a nice big green field and I don't want to put trees into it. I mean, I have suggested to farmers, could you not put a bunch of tree <laughs> in the middle of that field there and it would be much better for the livestock and it would, you know, help soil and filtering water. And they, they're they repulled by that suggestion. Quite a few of them are repulled by the fact that we'd want to actually ruin this lovely, nice big field. But, you know, it's just one, one conversation at a time, really. The cap... Um, will provide them with um, uh, with more, you know, opportunities to keep their payments and do um, this this kind of work. And so we're really looking forward to that coming in, so that we can support them in that as well. Yeah, very good. I see a comment there from 
uh, Carol, who is working in the Mulcair EIP in County Limerick in Tipperary, and she says she has 65 farmers implementing actions to improve water quality, but very poor uptake uh, of all the buffer zone actions uh, that are proposed. And I suppose that kind of suggests there's a cultural uh, issue here that, uh, you know, uh, you know, the idea of what, as you've been describing, what, what a good field looks like and what good land management looks like uh, is, is a challenge. Um, but um, we're also hearing, I think, that, um, you know, we have projects like yours, we have the the ASAP project, which is which is run by the well, is funded in part by the dairy industry, sending uh, advisors out onto farms, and we have our priority areas, but we just don't have enough of them. We don't have, um, you know, there are just small numbers of people doing very good work, but it's 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 not really enough. And maybe I'll ask you, Sinead, then. I mean, at the at the you're working at a higher strategic policy level. I mean. Ultimately, this is going to require investment uh, and it's going to require political decisions. I mean, do you feel uh, our politicians at the moment see this as a priority uh, faced with all the other crises that, that we're facing at the moment? No, I don't think I don't think they do. And the two or let's say the three main issues either need massive investment or there's a lot of political resistance. So with the those 208 wastewater treatment plants, that needs massive investment. And you know, Irish Water are taking a kind of a steady as she goes approach and not prioritizing those. And I and I'm not going to just blame Irish Water. I mean, it's the Irish state is responsible for implementing the water framework directive. So that's that one. And then ag with agriculture, you know, there is a drive to push agricultural production in a certain direction that. I mean, I, I appreciate all of the great work that's being done on the ground, but in a lot of areas where it's very intensive, there's a question to be asked as whether it's whether it's consistent at all with the water framework directive. And in certain catchments, it's not. And you can have all the buffer zones in the world, and you know there are there's just too many nutrients going onto that land, especially in free draining soil in the south and the southeast. So the water framework directive and Irish agriculture policy are like that. that. Like it's not just a lack of coherence; it's a complete and utter conflict. And so there does need to be political appetite, I think, in leadership to address that. Now, and that, and there's a third one as well. I'm conscious of time, and that's to do with the work of the OPW. And I saw two questions about that coming up. And um, this is where the water framework directive, I think, might have teeth in the end. And it does take a long time. We've seen it with the habitats directives, 30 years old this year. The water framework directive, I think, is going to eventually make its way into Irish legislation in the same way as Habitats Directive and maybe even stronger, because there's case law now at European level to say that, you know, you can't give a permit to activities that are going to compromise a water body meeting its objectives. So now that's happening all over the country, all over the time, all over the place. But there's a strong argument and the OPW are, are acknowledging that now and it's going to come in, I think, in the combined activities legislation there's going to have to be some sort of a prior assessment for developments that may potentially have an impact on water. And we're taking, and I think that go, is going to impact the OPW and they can see that coming down the tracks and they are building a bit more of that into their work. We are going one step further and we're saying that there needs to be a similar permitting system for intensification of agriculture. So we don't believe that ag farms, especially in vulnerable catchments, can continue to intensify when we already know that they're causing pollution and that there should be some sort of permitting or licensing like there is for intensive pigs and poultry. And likewise for forestry. So, I mean, it's an evolving area. In theory, the Water Framework Directive has all the mechanisms in place to have this assessment and to put controls on unsustainable development. And this development is unsustainable, not just for water, but for biodiversity and climate change as well. But we are still waiting for the case law and for it to be tested in court. So while the work is happening on the ground with voluntary measures, there's also exciting developments at a national level in, in terms of you know, improving regulations. Thanks very much for that, Sinead. Um, now, we've covered a lot of ground uh, in the last hour, and we said we were going to give people just an overview uh, of the Water Framework Directive and the various issues. And I want to thank everybody for staying with us for the hour. And you'll have seen that there are, you know, many cross uh, sectoral and, and, and overlapping issues, which is why we're holding another uh, three webinars on this issue. And uh, next week, we're going to be talking about 
physical modifications and the OPW and river drainage and all that kind of stuff specifically. And we have some very good speakers lined up uh, on that. Uh, we'll also be looking separately at the pressures on water quality, particularly agriculture and particularly wastewater treatment. And we'll be seeing Sinead back for, for that session in two weeks time. Uh, and then we'll also be having a session on uh, biodiversity uh, because we are the Irish Wildlife Trust at the end of the day. And practically all of our wildlife in Ireland relies on water to a very high degree. Uh, so it's a very important issue for our wildlife and our biodiversity. So uh, I want to thank everybody for, for coming along to this webinar. I really want to thank Trish and Sinead uh, for those really wonderful, clear presentations. And, uh, and I hope to see you back uh, next week. You'll find all the details on these webinars, as I said, and how to register for them on our website, uh, iwt.ie. And there's a page there just for the webinars with the links. So thanks once again, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.